Good evening. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kambiz Ranavardi, co-president of Columbia, D.C., and a graduate of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. I would like to welcome members of the Brown Club of Washington, D.C., also our affiliates, uh, CAA of New Jersey, as well as other guests joining us this evening. We are honored and privileged to have uh, Professor Mark Bittman, uh, a special advisor on food policy at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health and best-selling author to discuss the subject of his latest highly acclaimed book, Animal, Vegetable, Junk, A History of Food from Sustainable to Suicidal. Our host will be Emily Deach. Please allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, I do encourage everyone to check our website for their full bios. Mark Bittman is uh, the Special Advisor on Food Policy at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. Mark is also the Editor-in-Chief of Heated and is working on a television series based on uh, his latest book, which is the topic of our discussion today. Mark is a cookbook author behind 30 titles that are mainstays in countless home libraries. He has starred in four television series and has made hundreds of television, radio, podcast appearances, including on today's uh, on today's show, Jimmy Kimmel Live, Real Time with Bill Maher, and NPR's All Things Considered, Fresh Air, and Morning Edition programs. Our host, uh, Emily Deach, is an academic consultant based in Washington, D.C. She studied the history of art and architecture and American studies at Brown University before pursuing doctoral work in the same fields at uh, George Washington University. She serves as the vice president for a Brown Club of DC and also as managing director for the Atlantic Black Box Project and on the steering committee of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Without further ado, Emily, it's yours. Oh, here we go. Well, hi, Mark. Well, hi, Emily. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us again the second time. I'm happy to be here. It's so funny that there's no here, but and it's funny to be at a DC event and have no presence in DC whatsoever. But yes, great to be here. I'm excited. You feel like a regular now. Um, <laughs> and I know we said that we'd approach this like a dinner party, but a couple of bits of business first before we go there. Um, so for folks who are on the line, again, thank you for joining us. If you want to chat in questions, um, don't use the chat box, use the Q&A um, box, and we will get to those questions at the end of our kind of preliminary discussion. So we'd love to hear from you. Please put that in um, and we'll go from there. Uh, and then also wanted to announce or add to Mark's prolific bio, which is that you, in addition to publishing this juggernaut of a book um, this month, you also launched the Bitman Project um, as kind of your new mental piece um, for journalism. Do you want to say anything about that before we come well, to in? Just that um, I've been trying, and I, I have a little team um, of people who work with me, and we've been trying to find a way to do what amounts to independent journalism for the last four or five years. And I think that the Bitman Project is it. Uh, we have a Substack newsletter and an associated website and a bunch of different stuff. I don't think I'm really here to talk about that, although we can, but um, just if people are interested, they could go to bitmanproject.com or markbitman.com. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> That's perfect, of course. Um... And so because this book is so sweeping, it's, it's kind of a, a grand story of agriculture and um, policy and uh, cooking and how we eat now um, and, and what the prospects are for moving ahead in a sustainable way, I'd kind of like to start in a, a kind of personal note um, about kind of what draws you to food. And I'll share a brief story 
as to why in that um, when we had worked on a previous event that we did um, that talked about food and social justice, um, we had a, a quick chat on New, New Year's Eve and we were planning the event and it very quickly went into this happy moment where we were discussing the menu for that night and exchanged notes about cornbread and excitement for that. And it kind of let me know, um, yes, he, he loves to talk about the history of this, the science of this, the policy notes, but also he kind of just loves food. It's a common thread in all of your work. So for folks who have come to know your career, why food? What draws you to that? I mean, it's an, it's an old story and, um, you know, things, I, somehow questions like this are more interesting when you're 30 years old than when you're 70 years old, which is what I am. Not that it's an uninteresting question for you to ask, but that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but that um, whatever choices I made, so many of them are so far in the past that it's hard to, it's hard to find the right answers. I, um, I grew up in Manhattan. I, so I ate a wide variety of foods because we did. And it was in an era where not that many places had the kind of um, cosmopolitan cuisine that, that many have now. Um, but I was raised in that atmosphere. I started cooking out of self-defense because when I left New York and moved to Massachusetts, the food was so abysmal that I had to start cooking. And, and then it became, cooking became really one of my great loves, it remains that. And um, when I decided I wanted to be a writer, let's say 10 years later, or when I decided I would try to make a living being a writer, there was no one, any, nothing I was writing about interested anyone until I started writing about food. And then suddenly I was successful. And um, mm -hmm. so it wasn't that I turned 21 and decided that I loved food and wanted to write about it. It was the way lives are a very gradual, a kind of gradual thing. I think more interesting um, might be that around 2000, after writing recipes and, and cookbooks and successful cookbooks for for by that by that time, twenty years, um, fifteen years, um, around two thousand, I I saw what I thought was the writing on the wall, which was that our diet was all screwed up. The way we did agriculture was all screwed up. The future was in danger, uh, and that food and agriculture were a big part of the problem, the problems facing us. And I started to, and and I will say that at the same time. This, this followed uh, Eric Schlosser's publishing um, Fast Food Nation, which was an important book, but Diet for a Small Planet had been published 20 years before that, and that was an important book too. It wasn't as if people didn't know what I was discovering, I guess is what I'm saying. At any rate, I decided to try to shift gears and to, and to continue to write about cooking, which as I said, I really love, but... Um, to begin to write about the policy side, the public health side, um, the environmental side, the agricultural side of food. Because if you think um, that food is just about enjoyment and just about what your next meal is, you're missing a lot of the picture. And it took me a good 10 years to get that going because it wasn't in food sections uh, and among publishers, it wasn't a popular view. The popular view was food is about enjoyment, food is about restaurants, travel, other cultures, and so on. It's not about uh, workers in the fields. It's, it's not about slaughterhouses. It's not about uh, pollution, greenhouse gases, public health crises, and so on. A lot of people just didn't want to talk about that stuff. So it, it took a long time for me to... Um, especially at the times for me to be able to make that change. But I finally did. And as probably many people here know, I wrote an opinion column focused on food for the times for five years. And 
have not let up. And, and I left the Times in order to write animal vegetable junk. Um, and it took me four or five years from start until three weeks ago when it was published. I want to tell what I think is a hilarious story about it. And it concerns my mother who's not watching. Um, or if she is, hi, mom. But um, I don't think she does Zoom. Uh, I sent my mother the book. My mother has a little shrine, as, as I'm sure many authors' mothers do, um, with all my books, most of which she's never looked at, really. I mean, she's looked at the covers. Um, but she's very proud of me, which is sweet. I sent her the book, and she called, and she said, I know how hard you worked on this book, which was nice. And I know how long you worked on this book. So I was expecting a much bigger book. <laughs> so that conversation actually happened twice. And the second time I said, mom, maybe your comments would be better after you read the book. So maybe that's not a hilarious story, but that's where I come from. It's an identifiable one. Uh, <laughs> A, a person who pursued a doctorate and has English and German parents um, and who after seven or eight years of, you know, the, the work on the dissertation said, okay, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of wanted more. Um, Shouldn't you be getting along now? Yeah, but that actually brings to mind an anecdote that I think you've shared fairly widely, which is... Um, about when you were in, I think your minimalist column days at the New York Times um, and had pitched to your editors at the time an idea that uh, a column about food that was more serious, not just about joy and levity, um, which certainly food encompasses, but something that delved into the more serious issues um, about policy and nutrition, diet, et cetera, um, that your book um, does go into. And the editor said to you, it's not that interesting, right? Not quite, but close. First I had- Close, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> I mean, first I had what amounted to a three to five year battle with some of my editors um, around the ideas of writing more seriously about food. Uh, and, and, um, I, I also, by that time I had, had written the minimalist column for, let's say 10 years by then I was, uh, uh, modesty aside, or I don't know if modesty aside means anything. Anyway, I was a pioneer in, in doing video, food video, um, certainly at the times and generally, um. Frankly, I always thought that college students were off smoking dope and watching minimalist videos and not many other people were, but whatever, it, they were popular. Um, in any case, I was considered a valuable property um, at the times. And, um, and so I went to editors outside of the food world um, at the paper and they said, by all means, you should be writing about other things you wanna be writing about in a, in a way the times I can't speak for it now, but it was a very nurturing place for writers. Um, I was always or often encouraged to, to move in different directions. Um, so I did a number of pieces about the, the most popular of which was called The Taming of the Meat Guzzler, which was about <laughs> the intersection of great, great headline. I owed the copy editor big on that one. It was about the intersection of meat and climate change, overproduction and overconsumption of meat and public health. And it was a good piece. And um, I, I, did, I did some of those, again, thanks to the support of some non-food editors. And then I, um, based on the encouragement of another friend, went into the opinion editor's office and said, um, you know, you have columns on economics and on uh, uh, social justice and on all of these all of these regular columns you don't have a regular column about food no one ever writes about food and there should be food columns on the opinion page and he said uh is it interesting enough and i said why don't i have 
50 ideas on your desk tomorrow morning. And I did have 50 ideas on his desk. The, the problem with me is that they were my only 50 ideas, but I, I, may, I milked them for a while. And um, yeah, here we are. There's probably more than 50 ideas in, in the book, but maybe not many more. Anyway, it's a, to me, kidding aside, the, the story of food and its impact on humans um, and on civilization is underplayed. Um, there aren't a lot of books like Animal Vegetable Junk, and the ones that exist are mostly pretty academic. So the idea was to do um, an eminently readable, I, again, this is not, I'm not saying that's what happened, but um, the idea was to do an eminently readable book that is a, a history of the relationship between food and agriculture and humans where that history has led us, um, how, that, how that interacts with other aspects of history, where we are now, and how we're going to move forward. Because if we don't change the way that we do food, if we don't change agriculture and change our style of eating, then um, just add that to the list of things that threaten humanity because it's right up there. Yeah, I, I'd love to turn a bit later in the conversation to issues of publishing. That's a little bit more of a niche concern. I think a lot of folks who have showed up for this are interested um, in, in you and your career and kind of uh, the, the choices that you make. So um, regardless of whether it was a publishable idea or not, can you walk us through the origin story of this book? Because I gather it wasn't just something that came about at the times um, or in you know, the last 10 years, it was kind of baking for a while. It's a question I can answer better this week than I could last because um, I vaguely remembered a proposal that I was working on before I published, my first book was published in 94. And I vaguely remembered that in the late eighties, I, I was furiously writing book proposals. I was determined to hit on something that would work. Um, and one of them was not really this, but it was a history of food in America. So I wrote that proposal in 88 and I found it the other day. And then to my surprise, which I didn't remember, I wrote a similar proposal, much more like this one 10 years ago. Um, and I guess I never finished it or got distracted or whatever, but there it is in my files. And then, um, well, I left the Times because for a number of reasons, but the most germane one or ones um, are that I felt that things were getting a little repetitive for me. Um, and part of that is the nature of a weekly column because not everybody reads every column and, um, and things do develop and you're always looking for a news hook. So you might write a piece about GMOs and then a year later there's some new developments and um, or someone who didn't read that column might say to you at a party or by email you never write about GMOs whatever it began to feel repetitive and it also failed to do something that I wanted to do which when I started the column I thought I'm going to treat this column as a mosaic and I'm going to put together a picture of what the food system looks like. Um, and I'm going to do it a thousand words at a time. It doesn't work. Um, and um, I, I published the sort of greatest hits of my, my food column called The Bone to Pick. And it's 80 or 100 of my columns. And they hold together. It's fine. It's interesting. But it's not a story. And, and so when I... When I left the Times, it was with the idea that I would try to figure out a way to tell this story. And um, I have to say that the most helpful, I, I read a number of, in that first few months when I, I, um, I became determined to, to think about this very carefully and to read as much as I could, but, but widely, not just read about food, but try to get a sense of, a better sense of what it might mean to write about history. So I read, 
I don't know. I read everything from History of Modern Agriculture, which is a, a, a very important contemporary survey of everything that's happened since 1500, to McPherson's Civil War book. To I mean, I, I just, I read very widely. And um, I read that book. I can't remember what it's called. I read a really, a really cool book about how octopuses think. I, all, you know, all, all Please kinds. remember that title, Mark, I think. I will. Someone will, <laughs> someone will throw know. it in the comments. It's a real, it's a, it's a book people know. Um, but I think the most important book I read was Sapiens. And what I really liked about Sapiens, uh, what I really like about Sapiens is that it's a, it's a story and it's um it's a really big story. I mean it's the story of humans and it's 250 300 pages long and and you know without getting hypercritical it tails off a little bit at the end. Um but it's an it's an amazing story, really well told and I thought this is what I want to do. I want to tackle something big and food and humans is a big topic and I want to try to tell it in a way that that will be meaningful to people, that will be readable for people, um, that will be significant. And um, I'm not an academic. I mean, you know, I, te I teach at a public health school. Obviously I have some academic leanings and, and my dean um, hates it when I say I'm not an academic, but I don't write in an academic style and um, I don't really research in an academic style. I don't do original research so much. I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm barely a historian, but but I think I'm an okay storyteller. And I think um, I know that I did enough reading so that I was at a point where my brain couldn't hold anymore and things were starting to get repetitive in my head. And that's usually a good sign when it's that it's time to start writing. So I researched animal vegetable junk for for five years probably. And of those five years, I was writing the last two or two and a half years. Well, writing in a, an intermittent in a in an intermediate period of about 18 months and editing for the last last year. The editing process was quite long, not because it wasn't good, I don't think, but because we made it better. I liked the thing. I, I would agree with that. Um, and it just calls to mind some questions that I had had when I was reading this book because, um, not to get too personal about it, but I, I've, uh, most of your books on my shelf, I learned to cook in a broad sense from you. I have the How to Cook Everything series. I, I read the minimalist columns. I think a lot of folks um, who know you um, and care for your writing um, have in mind that minimalist approach and also your prose is minimalist. So you're straightforward, it's not Baroque. Um, and this felt very different for me um, because it was so completist, um, because it had footnotes um, and was expansive. It still had your voice, um, but do you feel that it, it's kind of a departure for you or is it kind of the, the stuff that you've been doing all along, but maybe you hadn't had the publisher for it? Well, it was a departure. Um, it's not, it's, let's point out that it remains not Baroque. And it and remains the, absolutely <laughs> not, no. Yeah. The language remains pretty straightforward. And I do pride myself on that. Um, I've always written, I've always been a writer. People always said to me, we can hear your voice in your writing. I think that's a compliment. My style's been pretty consistent. I think that one of the reasons the cookbooks were successful, one of the reasons, perhaps the main reason the cookbooks have been successful is that they're readable. And a lot of cookbooks are written by people who are not writers. So sometimes people ask whether I was a cook first or a writer first and, um, I, you know, I would say that I started cooking, writing when I was in eighth grade or 10th grade, and I started cooking when I was in college. So I guess I was a writer first, but it's not, I have always been a writer. I think I've always had a voice. I've always been encouraged by other writers, by teachers and so on to keep writing. Um, 
and I, and I've been now doing it professionally for 40 years uh, and and semi professionally for 50 years I guess I could say um, but still to write a thousand a hundred thousand or hundred twenty thousand whatever it is word work of historical nonfiction um, was a new arena and um, and a, a, a host of fabulous, wonderful new challenges. And and um, I'm not being sarcastic. I, I know I might sound a little sarcastic, but um, when I finished, when I really finished, when they ripped the manuscript from my, the virtual manuscript from my virtual hands, um, and I hit send for the last time on whatever the last version of this PDF was, um, and I'd written and rewritten 10 or 15 times and read and reread 20 or 25 times, there was a big hole. It was really, there was really a sense of loss. And I have not, I'm, I'm a fundamentally optimistic and reasonably happy person. I have not filled that hole. It's, it's really, um, I miss working on that book. So I'm looking for, for what's next. It's a different, I'm doing cookbooks. I'll always do cookbooks and I'll always write about, about cooking. And I have journalism. I do weekly, monthly, thousand word pieces, but there is really something different about a project that seemingly never ends. And I started to understand some of these famous guys, um, famous authors um, who'd be 20 years late on their manuscript or, uh, or like Robert Cairo who, refuses to be hurried on the last volume of the LBJ biography. Um, and that's not me. I, I tend to meet deadlines or at least come close. And I like to finish projects and move on to the next one. But, but this one was really different from anything I've ever done. And um, you know, I may never find anything quite so meaningful to write about, but I will look. You will look. Um, I was thinking earlier today that you are part of your prolific nature is that you're a putterer. You just love to be um, in conversation and doing something and discovering things and sharing that with other people. So absolutely, um, you'll find that. And I love to just for a nerdy anecdote here um, that the word recipe um, comes from the root word for uh, receipt or record. Um, and it has in mind the notion that somebody who creates recipes is also a writer. So maybe, <laughs> you know, you there share you that go. lineage. There you go. Um, but you mentioned um, kind of the, um, the forcible handing over of your virtual manuscript in pandemic virtual times. And I thought that we'd get to this later in the conversation, but that was in part, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, during the summer when you realized that kind of pan the pandemic and how that was affecting food systems and public health was something that you felt needed to be at least incorporated um, somewhat into the book. And, and delayed for that. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I, here's the thing about everything you write. If you want it published, you have to stop at some point. So yeah. um, <laughs> my dear departed friend, Gene Cooney, um, once said to me as I was struggling with the eighth or 10th rewrite of something that I've long since forgotten, there comes a time when you have to put a 30 on it. And in journalistic ease, Putting a thirty on it means you're you sit you hand it over you're done. So everybody knows this feeling, and everybody always feels every writer always feels like um, they could do a better job than they've done, and and would like some more time. So I was torn about whether to write um, how contemporarily contemporaneously to write as I was finishing the book. Did I? write about COVID? Did I write about Trump? Did I write about leading up to the election? Because I finished the book, finished, finished, put a 30 on it in July or August. And, and um, we were, 
I'm sure most people here agree, optimistic about a change in the presidency and at that point, but it was by no means, as, as we saw, a sure thing. And um, and COVID was, was overwhelmingly the hot topic in the news. Um, and COVID, COVID does speak to food in a way, and, I, and I'll get to that in a second. But um, I didn't want to get too, again, you have to finish. I didn't want to stress what was happening in July of 2020 in a book that begins at the beginning of time. Um, what happened, what's happened in the last year or two, and certainly COVID is serious as it is, it's passing. And, and five years from now, COVID's gonna be a super interesting subject for academics and people will still mourn the people that they've lost or they'll mourn their own, their own loss at being ill and losing part of their lives. And we'll all think of 2020 as one of the more bizarre uh, years of our lives and, I, and so on. Um, but it's not as important as some other things. And, and the, fact that, the fact that it was again underplayed that COVID kills more people who have comorbidities, who are, who are ill for other reasons is more important than COVID itself. So if COVID killed 300,000 Americans in 2020, which it did, and if it kills another 300, will have killed another 300,000 in 2021, which it probably will not, but, but could come close, that's still fewer than, than diet-related chronic diseases kill every single year. So I think a really interesting question about COVID, now that it feels, I, I don't want to be idiotic and I'm not on my way to a bar or a party, but <laughs> it, I got my second shot yesterday. It feels the numbers are going down. It, it feels to, to many people like the end is in sight. And I think by the summer there'll be, or fall certainly, there'll be some normalcy. Um, but but we called COVID a crisis. And, and even despite Donald Trump, we dealt with it maybe not well, but appropriately. We, our level of alarm was appropriate, but we don't deal with climate change as if it were a crisis and it is. And we don't deal with the public health uh, consequences of our diet as a crisis, which they are. Um, so I, I don't, I, there's, something, there's something to be said here and I don't know precisely what it is, but I'm doing some thinking about what, what the word crisis means and how you elevate something to the stature of crisis. Like we can say that the way that we eat or the way that we do agriculture uh, is a public health crisis. But then if we don't treat it as if it's a crisis, the word, pardon me, the word kind of loses meaning. So, and again, same, same thing with, with climate change. Um, there are there are steps we can take to improve agriculture and to improve diet. And they're not to get on the road toward really making a difference in, in the way we eat and the way we raise food. To, to put ourselves on that road is not that challenging. To get to the end of the road, of course, is an ideal. Mm -hmm. um, but to move down that road, to treat, to treat uh, the dietary consequences of the way we grow food and other public health consequences of the way we grow food, um, to start to deal with those things is not very challenging. To finish dealing with them is. But if you recognize that something's a crisis, then you say, what can we do? What can we do now? And there are five or 10 relatively small, I mean, they're huge, they have huge consequences, but um, easily achieved steps that we can take to improve agriculture, to improve the impact of food on our health and on the, our labor force and, and so on. And we're not, we're not doing that. And, and now there, there's, a, there's a Congress that has a, the potential of actually accomplishing something. Um, it's time to start doing those things. Mm -hmm. And 
what you point out is so important because you began work on this book so far beyond like before the pandemic um, even uh, was a blip on our radars um, or any pandemic that comes after this. Um, it was a crisis of another kind. And so nomenclature matters, information matters, and guidance about what to do about things matters. And I feel like that's at the heart of your book. And so in terms of nomenclature, can you talk to us a bit about the title? Because I'm a writer too, and a title junkie. What kind of inspired you to, to say animal, vegetable, junk, and then have that kind of uh, provocative tack on at the end there, a history of food from sustainable to suicidal. What um, felt like that was the right mantelpiece for this? Well, the subtitle, we, we call it the reading line. The reading well, line. 100% 100%, my editor, Bruce Nichols, my original editor, Bruce Nichols, um, he came up with that and he defended it and I like it. Animal vegetable junk was 100% mine. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, it's a, it's a, it's it de it's derived from a common phrase, um, but it does describe where food is at. And and so for for 200,000 years, um, the diet of Homo sapiens was of animal products and plants, um, which we can call vegetables. Junk is a new invention, and yet junk, junk dominates the American diet, and increasingly is beginning to dominate the global diet. As as American and other multinational corporations export our style of agriculture and our style of eating to the rest of the world, but but junk is a new concept. Junk didn't really exist until 1880 or so. I mean, there were desserts. But there weren't mass produced invented foods until the turn of the 20th century. And, and it's really only since World War II that they've been scientifically created and marketed in a way that has caused them not only to become dominant and not only to uh, negatively affect our health, but to determine what agriculture looks like. It's junk that determines what's grown. And it's what's grown that deter that determines what gets made. And, and those play off of one another. And what we have is a diet that's increasingly not of food, but of things derived from food crops and other, other ingredients that approach food. They look like food, but they don't nourish. And food by definition nourishes. So um, some percentage of our diet, and when I say our, I mean the American diet, is made up of, of calories that don't nourish us. And I think it's the majority of calories are, in fact, calories that don't nourish us, that by dictionary definition are closer to poison than they are to food. And, um, well, that's a long answer to a short question. I don't know when the phrase animal vegetable junk popped into my head. Some day that I was running in Berkeley, where I lived for a little while, and I called Bruce Nichols, who was my editor and publisher then, and said, I have a great idea for a book and I already have the title. And actually, um, I was just reading um, about Ed McBain, who's a, a, is a pseudonym for an old, old police procedural writer. And he said, he, he said, I always write the title first and then I wrote the, write the book based on the title. So I don't, I don't think I did that, but, but you could say I did that. It's good because it's so emphatic, I think, particularly with the word junk. It's so clear um, that, you know, that's where the book is headed, is, is headed to investigate junk because it, it's, just kind of a, an exclamation point of a word in the title. Um, and the structure of the book is in three sections. Um, it's kind of a broad history of ag agriculture. It's then the study of um, industrialization and um, kind of moving away from small scale 
um, agronomy, and then finishing with a, a section entitled change, um, which is kind of things that we can do or options um, that are avenues out of kind of the, the mess that the middle section lays out. So can you talk us through this kind of the strategy behind that structure and when, what you wanted to do there? Well, it's, it is, it's past, present, future, really. It's not that complicated. I, I spend a lot of time, I spent a lot of time on the past because as I said before, I found it, I find it fascinating. There are a number of turning points in our history where things could have gone differently. Um, that's always the case. You can't change any of that, but you can appreciate that there are, there are and have been, or I guess I should say there have been and are and will be turning points in in uh, in human life, in our in our personal lives and in our collective lives. Um, and if we can recognize them, or we can say this is a pivotal moment, the way we decide to go here is going to determine things for the foreseeable or even longer term future, um, our ancestors were not equipped to do that. So the story of how we got to producing food industrially is in retrospect, an interesting story. There's a lot of tragedy in it as there is in, in almost any history, um, but there's no going back and there's no fixing it. The lesson to be learned is that we can make decisions that change the future. Um, if we make the right decisions, we may well set ourselves on a more beneficial future than if we make the wrong decisions. And as far as the history of food has gone, we have made some of each, but the most critical decisions that have gotten us to this place, wrong is not the right word, but they've been unfortunate. And some of them, the consequences were foreseeable but maybe they're only foreseeable in hindsight. Still, I think the upshot of the book, the point of the book is that we know more now than we ever have. We understand things more scientifically than we have ever done. We uh, have a more comprehensive view of history and how things happen. And we have the power, and there's a reason that we've named this era the Anthropocene, we can change the destiny of humans and we can change the destiny of many of the other species of the planet and even what the planet looks like. We need to move forward with intent. We can see that there are paths that are righteous and just. Um, and we can see that there are paths forward that lead to disease and despair. And, and really it's up to all of us to push for the former as opposed to the latter. That's the message of the book. I think the book is, is an attempt to show people how important food is. It's an attempt to say, we can make models of how food and food production ought to look. And those models are important, <coughs> but equally important is pushing the political system to make the changes that we need to see made in order to bring about a more just food production system and a, and a more just diet for more people. I mean, if you, if you acknowledge that there's a food system and you say, what should a food system look like? Your likely answer is gonna be, well, the goal of a food system should be to feed as many people affordably and nutritiously as possible while, while um, inflicting minimal damage on the earth and on other species. Something like that. In fact, the food system is a, a means of making money for a number of multinational corporations. That's its primary goal right now, if you look at it objectively. Um, it does an okay job of feeding the richest third of humanity. It does a fair to poor job of feeding sort of another third, and it does a terrible job of feeding yet another third. So that's, that's not a great, batting average and add to that the contribution to climate change, the impact on other species, especially other animals that, that we eat, but countless species that um, are destroyed 
by industrial agriculture, uh, the impact of pesticides are on, on our environment, and so on down the line, we're not doing as good a job on this as, as we could. I agree, and there's so much to continue on that. I want to briefly remind folks that we'll get to your questions in a short bit, so please don't be shy about chatting them into the Q&A session. Um, Mark, something that you said a minute ago about, or a couple of minutes ago, um, in terms of us knowing so much about this already, um, and you know so much about this already, because this book is the culmination of um, a long career as a writer, but then um, just in the gestation of this book alone, years of research. Um, did anything surprise you? Catch you off guard in a good way or a bad way? Well, I didn't know a lot of the history, so I don't know if surprising um, or not. I think the, 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 the tendrils of agriculture extended even further into every aspect of life than I expected, but that was just because I hadn't thought things through, I think, or I didn't have enough knowledge to recognize that. I honestly think the most surprising thing is the real dominance of, of junk, of what, what you could call officially ultra-processed food or hyper-processed food, food that didn't exist until 100 years ago or 50 years ago and was literally invented in order to be sold. Um, that's a far cry from food as every other uh, human alive until say 1900 has ever known and, and almost all humans alive until 1950. Um, the dominance, the reach, the spread, um, that I think surprises me. I mean, Americans don't eat the most fast food in the world anymore. Other cultures do. Um, the fact that the fact that traditional diets have been almost obliterated, and the fact that every single traditional diet is healthier for people and better for the planet than the current reigning American diet. I don't know if it's surprising, but these are these are the things that are sort of most important coming out of the book, I think. Mm -hmm. That resonates just uh, thinking of my grandmother, who's part of the World War II generation and grew up saying, we prefer cows to chemists. And now in England, when I visit, um, uh, globalization has made its inroads, you know, um, the, the move away from, uh, you know, butter and um, just uh, fish, animal products, vegetables towards, uh, you know, uh, fast food chains and um, fly by night, easy calories is remarkable. Um, well, the Mediterranean diet barely exists in the Mediterranean and it's the healthiest, you know, scientifically demonstrated to be among the healthiest diets you can eat. Um, children are not being raised eating the Mediterranean diet in the Mediterranean. So anyway, if you want to get to some questions, I do have a dinner date. So uh, we Which don't have a lot of time left. Beyond important to keep. Um, I will close with one question um, for you which is slightly impossible because I want you to be able to touch on the optimism of your book which I think is important. It's not all gloom and doom. Um, but then also thinking about, again, with the pandemic, you had to um, close in your chapters at a certain point this summer before all of the remaining history of the pandemic was completed. So thinking about uh, what you might write um, as a coda for this. Um, speak to either or both if you can, and then we'll move to questions. I think they're the same. I, look, I said this before, and I know there are people out there who feel that this was an incomplete statement, so I'll try to finish it. There are a number of things we can do right now to move forward on making the food system healthier, more just, safer, and so on. And um, two of them are in the, in the budget reconciliation bill um, or the COVID relief plan, I can't, I, they're not the same thing, but they're being, they're happening at the same time. One is the $15 minimum wage. I don't expect that that's gonna be included in the bill, but five of the 10 
worst paying jobs in the United States, and arguably eight of the 10 worst paying jobs in the United States are in the food world. There are exceptions made for agricultural workers that make it worse to be an agricultural worker than a regular worker. And there are exceptions made for tipped workers. Um, at this point, that primarily means servers in restaurants um, that make it worse to be a tipped worker. So for people making $9 an hour or $10 an hour, $15 an hour is a huge raise. For servers in restaurants making $2.13 an hour, which is the federal minimum wage for tipped workers, $15 an hour is a game changer, a lifesaver, and so on. So that's a step forward that can be achieved relatively easily if there were, say, 52 Democrats in the Senate instead of 50 plus one, that would happen. Um, the second is uh, the, the Justice for Black Farmers Act introduced by Cory Booker, which has devolved uh, or evolved into a number of different a number of different um, acts and, and laws, all of which are good. And those are likely to be included in, in budget reconciliation. So those are, those are two important steps that are within grasp. Uh, if I wanted to be hopeful about what hap might happen in the next few years, I would say taking antibiotics out of the routine feeding of animals I would say enforcing existing regulations and creating new ones um, around the factory farming of animals. I would say enforce existing laws and create new ones around the use of pesticides, especially carcinogenic pesticides in the United States. I would say getting food back into the school curriculum, starting with four-year-olds and continuing till whenever. Um, let's stop there. If we did those, whatever it was, five or six things in the next two years, four years, five years, we would have gone farther in improving the food system than we have in the last 20. So I'm optimistic because some of that will happen. I'm less than optimistic because all of it could have happened in the last 10 years and none of it did. So I'll stop there. I think that's fair because we could go on forever and you have a dinner date, so let's get you there soon. I'm going to switch to one of the more popular um, questions, no surprise here, that we've gotten. It's the category of uh, kind of plant-based eating, the development of that, the popularization of that, um, and kind of what you can consider or foresee as the future of the food landscape. Um, but also Maya asks, I think, or she tacks on an additional interesting part of that, which is what do you think the, the most effective strategy to reach individuals is? So not talking policy, but actually persuading individuals um, toward that change. Uh, I think policy is the most effective way to persuade individuals. Uh, you have to make it so that, uh, let's back up a couple of steps here. If I say that, say, 60% of the calories in the food supply are ultra-processed food, are junk, that means that on average we're eating 60% of our calories from junk. Now, you may not be and I may not be, but that means someone else is eating more than 60% of their calories from junk. We have to make good food available and affordable and accessible. That's a policy decision. That's not a personal decision. And that's what's really important. As for plant-based diets, that's what I meant when I said I saw the writing on the wall 20 years ago. We all know that we need to be eating more, uh, more plants, less junk, fewer animal products. Everybody knows that. Some of us are able to make that decision to make that change in our lives and others are not. Policy can help with that. Um, undoubtedly among the questions being asked is what I think about the new plant-based meats. Um, and I think that they're not what we need to solve this problem. I think what we need to solve this problem is to recognize that we already know what foods are good for us. We just need to have them be available and affordable to everyone. The most important source of protein in the world is legumes. You don't need to turn legumes into something that looks like meat in order for people to 
eat it. You just need to teach people that this is the most important source of protein in the world. And that goes back to starting to teach kids about food when they're four years old, because everyone here tonight knows how hard it is to change your food preferences. And everyone here tonight knows that your food preferences were shaped when you were young. I think many of us, most of us probably saw that in the last year when we all gained 10 or 20 pounds because we allowed ourselves to eat our favorite foods, which happened to be the foods we were eating when we were eight years old. If we had been eating rice and beans when we were eight years old, we'd all be better off now. So until we, until we have a, a generation of four-year-olds that understands where food comes from, what food is valuable, how food is produced, we're not gonna have a healthy generation of 40-year-olds. You have to start young and everybody knows that. I think that's true. And actually that um, connects to um, kind of a larger system question that, that we had um, from Margaret, um, who's a farmer. So congratulations, Margaret. She's based just outside of DC in an urban farm, a community farm. Um, and she says they're trying to show how good healthy food is um, when grown and eaten, but they can't sustain um, as a health food system without real investment in non-industrial agriculture. So kind of what's the path forward there for folks who are like Margaret doing the right thing and educating probably a loyal set of um, uh, followers, but maybe not making big inroads. Well, thank you for hanging in there, Margaret, um, and any other farmers who might be might be here tonight. Um, not everybody knows this. Farmers all know it. Agriculture isn't easy, and agriculture isn't cheap. Uh, food appears to be cheap to us. There's way, way too much involved here for me to go into it too deeply, but food appears to be cheap to us, uh, in short, because it's subsidized. That doesn't only mean direct subsidies. It means we ignore the costs of producing food the way that we produce it. If, if food pollutes a nearby landscape, if food contributes to climate change, if food makes people sick, the producers of that food don't bear those costs. So all I'm saying here is that no matter what food we produce, it costs money to produce it. It's expensive to produce it. We happen to have a food system that subsidizes or incentivizes or encourages, for want of a better term, destructive, extractive agriculture. If we decided as a society that we wanted a food system, we wanted to subsidize, incentivize, encourage productive agriculture, agriculture that restored the dignity to farming, agriculture that supported agricultural workers, agriculture that produced nutritious and affordable food for everybody, we could do that. We can afford to do that. So the farmers who are hanging in there right now producing good food for their communities in the form of uh, uh, farm stands or CSAs or, or selling it to local supermarkets, kudos to them because they are bucking a system where the, where the deck is stacked against them. What we need to do is make it so that we are encouraging productive, real, good farming and we do that as a society. It's not a matter of individual choice. It's a matter of what we decide as a society, just as how we decide to educate our children or support our elderly people or build a public defense or build a road system or whatever else we do as a society that we can't do as individuals. That's how we should be thinking about food. It should be thought of as a, almost as a public utility. Could not have said it better myself. And we have a follow-up question about that sort of large scale uh, change. But a quick fun aside, we had, as you pointed out, somebody chatted into the comments, the title of the book you were searching for. See if this is right. Um, the octopus book of which Mark is likely referring is Other Minds by Pete. Exactly, Other Minds, yeah. <laughs> fabulous Bingo. book. Right after you buy animal vegetable junk from politics and prose by other, other minds. minds. Really, really fun read. 
Fabulous. And thank you, Justin, uh, for chatting that in. Um, and Jess here in DC, to follow up on our uh, kind of thread there about large scale change. Um, so moving away from small scale farmers and individual choice to corporations, um, particularly being in DC, many of us here, not all of us, uh, Amazon is a juggernaut, it's a corporate town. How do we incentivize corporations to make these changes as well when it's not purely um, an ethical, uh, you know, motivation? I, you know, I think you incentivize them by making regulations that requires them require them to do the right thing. And we've we've known for a hundred years. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt knew that corporations were not going to do the right thing unless you made them, and and that's. Uh, it's our failure to follow up on some of the, and I was thinking about this yesterday. There were some really intelligent innovations on, on improving what society looked like in the 20th century. Certainly it was not, that was not the only history of the 20th century, but there were, um, there were many things that happened that, that pushed things in the right direction. And instead of pushing things further in the right direction, we've spent the last, oh, let's say 20, 30, or 40 years trying to push back against progress. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a fundamental issue. I, I don't think we can count on corporations doing the right thing. I think we can try to make them do the right thing. Otherwise, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. This is, I know that, you know, I know that saying policy, policy, policy is, is a little repetitive, but the, the way things have developed in this country and the way things happen in this country are the result of policies. It's up to us to try to get positive, progressive policies in place to take the place of, um, of regressive, oppressive policies. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, moving slightly away from policy, but still in the, the corner of large scale change, where does education come into play? Um, because I think we can incentivize companies and policy changes perhaps, um, but it, it does come down to, at a certain level, the individual choices about um, what they can and should eat, what they're putting on their table. It's absolutely buttressed um, by what's available, um, but does education about re-education maybe play a role in this? Slippery slope re-education. I, I do think that when it comes to education, our focus should be on children um, it, because it is hard for grown-ups. It is hard for adults to change the way that they eat. I think if we can change the food supply, if we can change the way we're doing agriculture, we will make progress. But I think if you wanna look in the long-term future, we should be thinking about what a curriculum looks like that starts when kids are two or four and focuses on food. And there are people, Alice Waters among them, who've been thinking about this and saying this for years, if not decades, but it remains true. Um, you learn how to speak the language. It's easiest to learn a language when you're young and eating is a kind of language. And, and to the extent that we can teach children how to eat, what food means, what food is all about, where it comes from and so on, we will be building, raising healthier adults. I think one more question and I got to run. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll close with a silly one and then, um, <laughs> well, it's, it's one that I love and hate it. And I think that you'll feel the same. It's about guilty pleasures. I don't have them. <laughs> Um, You're the only uh, one in the room, I can tell you. <laughs> Do you have guilty pleasures? If so, what are they and why are they guilty? I mean, it, it's completely, it's a germane question because I already answered it. I mean, I didn't answer it specifically by saying a kosher hot dog or whatever I'm in the mood for, but I can answer it by, because it could also be good and plenty or or any number of things that are a guilty pleasure, but they all come from my childhood. They were all learned before I was, honestly, they were all learned before I was 10 years old. Every single 
food related guilty pleasure that I have comes from the 1950s. And I think that if other people think about it and they're honest with themselves, they'll recognize that most of the foods that they learned to love in that kind of way that they know is probably not so good for them, they learned as children. So imagine if, if that food wasn't kosher hot dogs, sliced pizza, nickel candy bars, whatever it is that I grew up with, but had been good food and real food. That's the stuff I'd be craving when we're all stuck in the house for a year. Anyway, I want to thank you, yes. Emily, and I want to thank Columbia and Brown and everybody else involved in this, especially politics and prose. Thank you. You're doing my uh, job for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can say it all, all over again, but yeah. you've done a great job. It's really been fun. So thanks. It's lovely to chat. Uh, quick, what's for dinner? Uh, I made, um, I'm calling them gougere, but really they're savory beignets. And I don't, I can't really explain what that is to anyone who so doesn't New York know. how far from DC? <laughs> <laughs> savory be beignets and uh, some pasta or other that I haven't figured out yet. But, but I gotta go, I gotta go cook before. Yes, I eat. absolutely. Please do. Thank you, Mark, um, for all of us. And as Mark mentioned, um, for the, the book, please, please visit either from Columbia's links or Brown's links, uh, the Politics and Prose site for his book. You can get 10% off with the code SPECIAL10. Mark, this was a joy. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, everyone. Good night.